welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, tonight we're just so thankful for your presence in your house, moving amongst your people, God. Lord, we just know that you've already done great and mighty things in our midst, God. Thank you for that. Lord, as we open up your word, we pray that you open us up to receive it, open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we give our attention, our interest, our focus. God, we will diligently apply this word to our lives. God, we know you'll give us grace and strength, and God, you'll do greater things than we could even ask or imagine. Lord, how awesome, how mighty you are, how wonderful you are, that you can speak a now word to every heart in this place, God. God, we would ask that for the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, and even the correction and discipline that we need for our everyday lives. God, we love you, Lord. And God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, there are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. No time do we think of ourselves as anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in one field. That's yours. Building one kingdom. That's also yours, God. So, Lord, we just ask that you would bless them as you bless us this night. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. Amen. You can have a seat and get your Bibles out. You want to open up your Bible to a place, you can start by going to the book of Titus in the New Testament. Titus, we're going to be in Titus chapter 2 in a moment. But I wanted to talk to you about an interesting subject. Throughout this week, I was thinking about what we were going to come and talk about. About here on Sunday night, in my prayer times and talking to the Lord, the Lord dropped a subject in my heart called a Christian's response to a crazy world. How many of you know we're living in a crazy world? See, we, we sang a song tonight that said, let the world say that I'm crazy. Because oftentimes when people look at a Christian's life, they say, hey, why? you know, even the Bible describes this. They'll look at your life and they'll say, hey, why don't you dive in with us? We're having a good time here. Everybody loves each other. Everybody's happy. And you're crazy not to want to get involved with what we're doing right now. And yet to the Christian, we are looking from the other side, looking out at the world, and we're going, no, you, not everybody's happy. You're all fighting. You're all mad at each other. It's all about every person is being selfish. You're backbiting, gossiping, uh, I mean, just doing crazy stuff. And, and we knew the outcome of those things in our former lives before we gave our hearts to the Lord. We used to do that stuff, and we remember the pain that it brought. We remember the frustrations. We, we remember the times of confusion. And now that we're on the other side, now that we've been brought out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light, now that, now that we've been enlightened, now that we know our God, now that we know our King, now that we're walking with Jesus, we found out what true love is. We found out what true joy is. We found out that happiness, I, I'll, I'll be happy and I'll, I'll be sad, but that doesn't matter. I've always got the joy no matter what. Now that we've experienced all this, we look out at the rest of the world and we say, you guys are crazy. Why? Because, my goodness, God's offering us eternal life and yet we're still messing around with drugs and sex and fame and fortune, all that kind of stuff that's utterly meaningless. And we see the world doing different stuff. You know, people get together and they make decisions and they they feel like they're wise and, and, and they understand things like that. And you can watch the news and you can watch current events and you can just go, my goodness, this world is going down the toilet fast. It's crazy. And yet tonight, I'm not here to preach to you current events or to preach those things. I'm here tonight to preach the gospel. And the good news of the gospel is that no matter what the current event is, no matter what's going on out there in the world, whether they're crucifying people outside of Rome, whether or not there's something going on in the Americas or in the South America, doesn't matter what's taking place in current events, doesn't matter the state of the Middle East or, or what's going on over there in Africa. See, it doesn't matter the current event. What matters is, is that we can have hope and we can have an answer for those that ask. So the question tonight is, are you ready for this? How should we respond to a crazy world? How should we as Christians respond? See, it doesn't matter if there's persecution or blessing. It doesn't matter if there's prosperity or recession. It doesn't matter what wartime, peacetime. We as Christians always can respond to a crazy world with the wisdom of God. So 
how should we respond? Well, we respond in a couple of ways. Tonight, I want to take a look at four things. I'm going to say the, the words, we respond, and then we'll complete that statement four times tonight. And as we go through tonight, I believe that you're going to be encouraged. I believe that as you walk out of this place and you go to work, you know, Monday morning, and, and your, your boss is talking to you about things, and there's conversations during the lunch break and that sort of a thing, you'll be able to step in in confidence, in faith, believe in God, and you will have an answer to those who ask of you. You'll be able to impart the wisdom of God that God has imparted to you. Are you listening tonight? So we respond a couple of ways. Number one, we respond, number one, without compromise. We respond without compromise. See, a lot of people, they, they, they kind of shy away from this, and they're afraid to be a bold Christian. Why are we so afraid as a church to be a bold Christian? Well, I don't want to offend anybody. I've been working on them for a long time. I want them to get saved, and if I offend them, I'm going to run them off. Now, while I understand that thinking, while I agree to some degree with that thinking, uh, can I tell you something? There's a lot of offended people that still became Christians. I've heard testimony after testimony after testimony of people that maybe they were in church and they heard the word of God from the pulpit. They said, who's this kid preaching the gospel? Who's this old guy preaching the gospel? Who's, who's this white guy? Who's this black guy? Who's this? I mean, what, what is this all about? They got a woman in the pulpit and they're offended. And they don't like it. And not only that, at this church, there's a pastor in your face telling you things you don't like. And it rubbed their flesh the wrong way. And maybe they left this place. They didn't get saved. They were offended. And they said, I'm never going back to that church again. And yet they came back to this church again. And yet they sat in the same seat, same spot, listened to the same preacher, had the same offense. And when it came time to give their heart and life to Jesus, somehow their hand went up. They walked the aisle and gave their heart to Jesus. We have people working on our staff that sat through months of offenses in the house of God with preachers telling them things that they don't like, and yet they still got saved. Now today they are so excited, on fire for Jesus, loving the Lord, and, and going on with God. See, we're so afraid of offending people, but honestly, can I tell you something? It's in those times of offense sometimes that people are shocked into actually having to think and consider what's going on because it is so abrasive and rubs them so the wrong way that it leaves something on them, it scratches at them, and they got to find out what is that itch all about. Are you listening? See, the Apostle Paul called the gospel foolishness to the Greeks and in offense, a stumbling block to the Jews. See, the Jews looked at Jesus and they were offended. They said, Ugh, this is the Messiah? No, that is not the Messiah. Jesus on the cross? No, no. Our Messiah is going to be a ruling, reigning. He's going to come in. He's going to wipe out the Romans. And so that was a stumbling block to them. They tripped over it and they fell. The Greeks looked at it and they said, this, this is the one? This is the... God in the flesh, this is your God. He's weak. He died. And now you're going to say he was raised again? That, they just kind of scratch their head. That's foolishness to them. And the Bible says that the gospel to those that are being saved is a sweet-smelling fragrance. See, we, we hear the gospel. We hear the good news. We, we hear about Jesus' blood. We hear about the sacrifice. And, oh, my goodness, that smells good. That's awesome. That, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. And yet the Bible says that to those that are perishing, it's the stench of death. That same burnt offering that was a sweet-smelling aroma in one's nostrils is the smell of death in another's. Oh, gosh, Jesus on the cross died for me? I don't want to have anything to do with that. So there's going to be an offense by nature, the fact that you are preaching the gospel. Going to be an offense no matter what you do. So just get used to it. Just don't compromise. Are you listening? See, I believe that if there was a church that held to the truth without hypocrisy and just said, this is who we are. I love you. Be nice about it. See, the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, kindness. See, there are some things that should be pouring out of you. You don't want to browbeat somebody with your Bible and tell them you need to get saved. You're going to hell. That's, that's going to push them away. I get that. Remember, I said I agree with that reasoning to some degree. But to the degree that we start to compromise, now we have lost our witness. And it's not doing anybody any good. Not doing you any good, not doing them any good, and it sure isn't doing God any good. Are you listening tonight? 
So how do we respond when they start bringing up the current events? What do you think about the decision that was just made in the Supreme Court? What do you think about what our president said? What do you think about what the local government here in California said? What do you think about our governor? All that kind of stuff. Listen, this is how we respond. We respond without compromise. You want to know what I think? Open your Bible, please, if you would. To, no, see? And you just let them know. See, they have just opened the door to you. And he's, oh, wait, 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 don't preach to me. You said you want to know what I think. Well, that's what the Bible says. Well, that's what I think. You want to know what I think? It's right here. And the Bible says we should be ready. That means like a trap, like a snare. You just walked right into that one, right? Oh, oh you're on my time now. You asked, I'm going to tell you. This is the way it goes. You know, you could have your own little sermon prepared. You could preach down heaven on them, and they could walk away. And they might be offended, yes. Oh, how dare they break out the Bible in front of me. But can I tell you something? This is the ever-living word of God. This divides between joint and marrow, soul and spirit. And as you take this out like a surgeon's scalpel, you will cut to the heart of the matter. The Bible says that at the preaching of the gospel that people are pierced to the heart. And they may reject it for a little while, but if you hold to it uncompromisingly... They're going to watch your life. They're going to look at you. They're going to test you out. They're going to be saying, let's see if what that preacher said really is going to come to pass. Let's see if they'll hold on to it. Let, let's watch and see. They said that they love the sinner even though they hate the sin, even though they disagree with the lifestyle. They still Let's see how they operate because, you know what, there's a sinner right there, and they're talking to him. They, they, they believe in submission to authority. Let's see how they deal with the boss on the job. Hello? They, they believe that children are to obey their parents. Let's see how their family life looks. See, your relatives are watching, your coworkers are watching, your neighbors are watching, people at the store are watching. They saw you get out of the car with that rock bumper sticker on. Don't kid yourself. You know how I know? Because I see all your cars. You all see mine too. Praise the Lord. So we're to respond without compromise. You're there in Titus chapter 2? Titus chapter 2, if you will, verse number 11. Check this out. Titus chapter 2, verse number 11. Take a look at this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Verse number 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. I, I love what the, I believe it's the New International Version. Anybody sneak a New International Version in here tonight? Anybody got the NIV in here? Right over here, Pastor W, you got it? Does it say, what does it say? Saying what to ungodliness? Saying no to ungodliness. That means without compromise, that when ungodliness raises its head and somebody wants to push you into a compromise, you can say no. Let's, let's practice that for a second. Okay? Look, come on. Get your backbone. Come on, sit up in your chair. Don't slouch now. And I want you to say No. Uh, see, no, you're, you're going to get beat up. <laughs> That's not going to work, okay? The devil is in your face. The world system is pushing, it's vomiting, it's garbage on you. And it says, I want you to eat this vomit, this garden. Now, what do you say? No. There it is. There it is. See, slap the devil. No! Tell him. Get after it. Don't compromise when it comes to the things of God. You know, sometimes we get so nervous and we get in a conversation, I don't know, and we start talking fast, I don't know what to do, and, and all of a sudden we find ourselves back saying, well, you know, it may be okay for, the, and, I, and I, I don't have any problem with it. No, 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 no. I have a problem with it. Why? Because people are going to hell. Why? Because it's going to ruin your life. Why? Because I used to do that junk and it got me nowhere. Let me show you how to get somewhere. Don't back down, church. Uncompromising. Thank you for those three holy amens. Verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope, glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, you're not answering to anybody here on the earth. You're going to answer to Jesus when he comes. My goodness. That's who we're trying to please. Stop trying to please men. If you are a man pleaser, then you are not a God pleaser. But if you are a God pleaser, please God uncompromisingly without wavering, steadfast in the faith, and then God will take care of you. Even if it brings persecution, don't shy from persecution. That is a blessing. We'll see that later on. 
Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. See, we got brought out of that stuff. We shouldn't be compromising, playing with that stuff, patty caking with it. Oh, it's okay for you. Don't worry about it. You're all right. No, it's not okay. Now listen, how you present that should be seasoned with salt. You need to be wise and discern and use tact and diplomacy when talking to people. Yes, but still don't compromise. That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Zealous for good works. You know what a zealous person is? Passionate, excited, ready, wanting, desiring, going after it, doing what? Good works. See, we, we, we've been brought up in a society that good works is, is cool and that sort of thing. No, we do it because we love the Lord. And people say, oh, well, you're just religious and you don't have to do that stuff anymore. Oh, no, I don't have to. I get to. It's my joy. It's my honor. It's my excitement. This is my bread and butter. If I don't do this, it will be like fire on the inside of me. I'll get burned up. I need to use this fuel. And I need to do what God has called me to do. So how do we respond to a crazy world? Number one, we respond without compromise. Second thing, how do we respond? Well, we respond with prayer. We respond with prayer. Our first conversation on matters should be with God. Plain and simple. Here's something crazy out there in the world. You're watching the news and all of a sudden you hear something that's shocking. Shouldn't be. That would have never been in the generations past. My goodness, if our forefathers came back, they would kick our behinds. And what do we do? We call it, hey, did you watch the news, right? We talk to our husband or wife. Did you see this? No, 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 no. First conversation starts with God. Lord, what do you think about this? Lord, how, how should I respond to this? Well, what should I tell my wife and my husband? What should I teach my kids about this? They're going to deal with this, Lord. See, we, we need to bring everything to God in prayer. God wants to be intimately involved in our lives. God is not shocked. He's not surprised. God tells the end from the beginning. God is the author and the finisher. He is the alpha and the omega. He was there in the beginning. He's there in the end. God sees the plan of the ages. God knows what's going down. God knows that he put you in this place at this time with what you were going to face. And so God's not concerned. He's not worried. He's not biting his nails and knocking his knees. No, God has it under control. So we need to take our fretful hearts, take those fears and those anxieties, and God say, Lord, it's it's crazy. What do we do? God, what do we do? God will speak to you. God will comfort you. God will strengthen you. God will show you what it is that you're to do. Pray for the crazy people. How about that? We should be praying for crazy people. Amen. Lord, help them. I used to be a crazy person. Amen. God, I used to be stupid. Didn't know what I was doing. Putting other people down to get myself up. God, I, I used to be in that position. God, I used to have compromise. Now, Lord, here I am. And God, I'm in a position, Lord. I want to set up a hedge. God, I, I want to stand in the gap for these people. God, don't bring your judgment on us, Lord. God, bring your mercy. Bring salvation. Send laborers into the harvest field. God, it's ripe. It's ready. It's crazy. And so we need to get out there. Lord, use me. See, we need to pray. We respond with prayer. People are lost and they need to be found. They need to be found while they're still a long way off. If you remember the terminology from the prodigal son, see the father is waiting, but the father is watching. And we need to pray that these people come to themselves and realize that they're desiring the pods of pigs when God is offering them a place at his table. And so we need to pray, God, Save souls. God, turn it around. God, change our nation. God, change our world. God, change my workplace. God, change my neighborhood. God, change San Bernardino. God, change the Inland Empire. God, change and rock this valley. God, turn it around. God, use me. God, use this church. God, use your Christians. God, use us. Do it, Lord. See, those are the prayers that God says, all right, let's go to work, son, daughter, let's do this. What can God do with a passionate people who will pray and believe God and then add legs to their prayers? Get out there and tell someone about Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, turn me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 5, great section of scripture. One of those sections of scripture that I believe Jesus has a smile on his face as he's blowing everybody's theology, Matthew chapter 5. 
He is like in their face about stuff that they used to think, and he's just flipping all of it upside down, telling them stuff that they thought wasn't God, but yet he's showing them what really is God. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 44. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 44 says this. Just said you, he just got done. This is Jesus talking letters in red in my Bible, maybe in yours too. So Jesus is speaking. He said, you heard it said, you shall love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Verse 44. But I say to you, Jesus said, you've heard this said, you should hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, this is one of those verses that we wish that we could just, I, I don't know about you, I wish sometimes that I could just rip that page out of the Bible, crumple it up, and not have to deal with it. Why? Because I don't like that. Can we be honest? We don't want to bless those that curse us. Somebody tells us we're number one, we want to tell them they're number two with both hands. I won't give you the visual. Right? Somebody yells at us. It's eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? You cut me off. Oh, I'm going to zoom around you and cut you off, Rock Church bumper sticker or not. You were asking for it. Somebody uses you, abuses you. Oh, eye for an eye. Here we go. They talk about you. I'll talk about them. They stole from you. I'll steal from them. They keyed my truck. You don't even know it. Could have been a shopping cart. Could have been your kids. Oh, but you're going to get even somehow. And yet God says, I don't want you having this tit for tat kind of a mentality. This is not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth any longer. No, this is I say to you, love your enemies. Love them. What is that? Personal self-sacrifice for the betterment of someone else. That means that if somebody is considered your enemy, which there are people out there who would be self-proclaimed enemies of the cross of Christ and of everybody who names himself a Christian, what does God tell us to do? To love them, to sacrifice our desires, our needs, our will, our want for their betterment. It doesn't make any sense to our natural mind, but when you do that, what are you doing now? You are breaking them down. You are killing them with kindness. What does that mean? You're breaking down walls. They cannot stand up to that power. You say, what power, Pastor? Love. Because God is love. Therefore, love is the supreme power of the universe, and if we have a problem, it's not with our enemies, it's the problem of that we're not loving enough. And therefore, if you want to overcome, you're going to have to do it in faith, how? By love. So love your enemies, bless those who curse you. Somebody starts mouthing off, telling lies on you, gossiping about you, starts cursing your name, you start to bless them. You start to pray for them. You start to encourage them. You start to say, hey, listen, I know you don't like me, but you know what? I love you. You know what? I care about you. I, I love you enough. Have you heard this before? To tell you the truth. See, you're overcoming all the obstacles, just leaping over the walls that they've built. Do good to those who hate you. See, it's hard for us to do these things. We don't want to do good. I don't want to buy them a soda. I, I don't want to bless them with a Snickers bar. That's my Snickers bar. I don't want to bring them a cold cup of water on a hot day. Why? Because I need it. And yet God says, I want you to bless them. Bless them. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. There's a lot of persecution going on. A lot of Christians are shrinking back because they don't know what to do with persecution. Persecution is not a bad thing. Persecutions are going to come. Persecutions are going to happen. And we can view them as bad or we can view them as opportunities to hit our knees and pray for them. Because this is the will of the Father in heaven, and we can be pleasing to God when we do it. Let's take a look at the next couple of verses. Look at this. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Verse 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you were here this morning, you heard that every now and then God likes to throw us a little curveball in the middle of the word. You'll be reading about one thing, you'll be getting a hold of it, and all of a sudden here comes this weird stuff that you, you don't think is really related. This is one of those sections of scriptures here. Talking about persecutions, talking about people we don't like, talking about people we don't want to be around, we don't want to pray for them, we don't want to bless them, we don't want to love on them. 
And yet Jesus is saying, I'm telling you, you got to do all that stuff anyways. Now all of a sudden he starts talking about the sun rises and the rain falls. What is he talking about? Well, he just said that you may be sons of your father in heaven because God, in his love and his benevolence, in his grace, he offers it to everyone. There is no discrimination. There is no favorites. When it comes to salvation and the blessing of God, they're available to everyone. Everyone. Anyone and everyone has this available to them. And so God makes the sun to shine on everybody. Good, bad, indifferent. Doesn't matter. And God sends his rain on them. So when we allow our light to shine, just like God does, and when we shower people with blessings, just like God does, now we're sons of our Father in heaven, we show that we are a part of the family of God. Take a look at the next verse. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? No, he brought up tax collectors two times. You know why? Because these people were hated in Israel. These people were most likely a Jewish person by birth that under the Roman op occupation went as a traitor and said, hey, I'll take money from my people to have a good standing with you. Now, not only did they take money from their people in taxes, which would have been bad enough, oftentimes they took more than what was necessary and they lined their own pockets with it. So these people were double hated because number one, they were a traitor, and number two, they were unjust. And so here Jesus says, the tax collectors, these people that you hate, they love people that love them. And what are you doing more than them? You want to be a son of God? You want to be a daughter of God? You want to be called one of the children of God? You need to go over and above and beyond. If the lowest level of society, the scum of the earth at that time was tax collector, this would be you if all you did was the same thing they did. So he says, don't just love people that love you. Don't just bless people that bless you. No, go beyond that. Pray for them. Love them. Bless them. Verse 48, therefore you shall be perfect, mature, and complete, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. As Christians, we are called to grow up, mature, and be like God. Not going to do that if we compromise. Not going to do that without prayer and effort on our part. Are you listening? Christian response to a crazy world, we respond, number one, without compromise. Number two, with prayer. Third thing, Christian response to a crazy world, we respond with joy. We respond with joy. Now, this is not a natural response because I know when I watch the news, which is not often because it's depressing, let's be honest. When I watch the news, there's not a smile on my face most of the time. Most of the time, it's so-and-so got murdered on the corner of 5th and Main Street, and it's like, oh, my goodness, and then you flip to another news. Maybe there's some good news on the other one. And all it is is about celebrities, and you're going, isn't there any real news on? Then you switch to the real news, and you find out that there's people bombing each other in another nation. There's people that aren't eating. There's people that are in a famine. There's economic collapse. There's nothing but junk, 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 and you walk away from the news feeling like you need to go take a shower. Because it's just dirt, it's just vomit, it's just depressing. And you wonder, my goodness, God, how, how can you not just burn the earth up right now and just come back and just, you know, take us all out? God, have mercy on us. And yet God says, when you're in the midst of a problem, when you're in the midst of a trial, when the world starts getting crazy, that you should respond not in reaction to the world, but based on what's on the inside of you. And if you have the Spirit of God on the inside of you, then the fruit of the Spirit is love. Second one is what? Joy. And that means we can rejoice. Numerous scriptures throughout the Bible, James chapter 1, count it pure joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials and temptations because you know that this is going to produce character. You know that the testing of your faith produces that character, that godliness and study. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. I mean, it just on and on and on and on. All throughout the world, you, all throughout the word of God, you will find that the response that we should have as Christians to problems, to trials, to pains, to a crazy world is joy. Now, let me show you. I, I mentioned we were going to see something about persecutions. Matthew chapter 5, you're already there. Back up to verse number 11 and 12. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 11 and 12. Take a look at it with me. What's the very first word in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11? Blessed. 
Okay, let's all say that together. What is that word? Blessed. Blessed. Okay? In the message paraphrase, you will find that it says, happy and to be envied is he. I love that. Happy and to be envied is he. So blessed are you, happy are you, to be envied are you when they give you flowers and kisses and hugs. Bring you your favorite candy and remember your birthday. Is that what it says? No, it says you're to be blessed. Blessed are you, happy are you, to be envied are you when they revile and persecute you. And say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. See, church, if we're doing our job, if we are expressing the love of God and preaching the gospel, that's going to happen. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We're blessed when that happens. See, that's what the word of God tells us. The disciples, you can find this in the book of Acts, that when their backs were beaten open and they were told never to preach again in the name of Jesus, they said, we got to answer to God and not to you. They were beat up and they were sent out and they were warned not to do it again and they walked out rejoicing. Why? Because they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. Church, I don't know about you, but it is my desire not just to make people mad, just to make people mad. No, it's my desire to get out there and do something for God that is so audacious, so noticeable, so pure, and so loving that the world, the darkness, just can't stand still. Oh, they just got to spout out. They got to say something. They, they get mad about it. Maybe you've heard that no publicity, even bad publicity, isn't bad. It's actually good. A lot of times that's why celebrities will do crazy things in order to get on the news again because they want to get their name out there because that'll sell their movies and all that kind of stuff. Church, if we are doing our job, we're going to get a lot of bad publicity. If we're out there loving people's life on the streets, they're going to say, this church, man, you're, you're not doing the right thing. You know, there were healing ministers who were persecuted and who were locked up in jails because they were not practicing medicine with a license. The world came after and said, you can't pray for people's healing anymore because that's practicing medicine without a license. What was going on? They were just doing the thing that God had called them to do, loving people. And if we're out there telling people about Jesus, my goodness, there's going to be people that are going to want to shut us down. There was somebody who was feeding the homeless here in San Bernardino many years ago, and I remember in the newspaper article, they shut him down because he was handing out donuts and orange juice without a food handler's license. You've got to be kidding me. That's crazy. He's feeding people. He's loving people. And you're going to shut him down because he didn't have a food handler's license? I don't think they care. I think they're hungry and want somebody to love them and want somebody to notice them and want something, somebody to tell them about Jesus. You're going to shut him down because you didn't have a food handler's license? See, church, if we're doing our job right, we're going to ruffle some feathers. We're going to rattle some cages. We're going to rock the boat. Hello. And therefore, there's going to be persecutions. Next verse, verse 12. Take a look at it with me. Go ahead. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Guys, there is a special blessing in heaven for those who endure, for those who go through the trial. We're so afraid of it. Stop being afraid. You're stronger than you know. You've got God on the inside of you. You can do this. You can make it. Doesn't matter what they do to your body. Doesn't matter what they say against you. Why? Because you've got God on your side. And if God be for you, then who can be against you? The Lord is your helper. What can man do to you? Oh, I should have had a better amen on that. But I think it's because we're so concerned. What are people going to think of me? Am I going to lose all my friends? Doesn't matter. You've got a friend in Jesus, and you've got a church that's here to back you up and love you, and we'll, we'll, we'll get you in the fight once again. Come on. My goodness, we're all in your side. We're in your corner. Feel beat up in the world, man. We will help you. We'll encourage you, build you up so that you can go out there, knock the devil out. My goodness. How should we respond? Well, we respond number four. Last one for today. You guys got time for one more? Yeah. We can respond. With confidence in Jesus. Really, that's what all of these things stem from. We can respond with confidence in Jesus. There was a time when Jesus was giving his disciples kind of a preview of the events that would happen in Jerusalem and all over the world before his return. He really kind of talked about two things. One, he talked about what was going to take place at the destruction of Jerusalem. Then he started to tell them about what was going to take place before he returned. 
they were taking a walk, and they were walking through Jerusalem, they were looking at the buildings and things like that, and he called his attention to it. He said, all, all these stones are going to be knocked over, gates are going to be burned, people are going to be running away. My goodness, I hope there's people that aren't pregnant or nursing infants during that time. He said, flee to the mountains. So he starts to tell them the crazy things that are going to take place. It was going to get crazy in Jerusalem. He tells them about some things that are going to take place before his return. Crazy things. But things that we see taking place every day. Church, let's not kid ourselves. Let's not fool ourselves. The Lord's return is closer than we know. Amen. Jesus is coming. We need to take this seriously. That's why we can't compromise. That's why we need to pray. And that's why we need to rejoice. Because our king is coming. So he starts to tell them what's going to happen. He starts to tell them false Christ. People are going to come and say, I'm Jesus. I'm the Christ. Come and worship me. That's already happened. It's already taking place. Wars and rumors of war, that's taking place right now. Famines, floods, earthquakes, great signs in the heaven and on earth. Can I ask you, has anybody seen the news? Remember the tsunamis? Not just one, tsunamis. All the earthquakes taking place. I mean, Japan got totally wiped out. South America, Christchurch, New Zealand. The list goes on and on and on and on. All of these signs are taking place. And he tells them th some things throughout his discussion of these events. He tells them a couple things, okay? Quick, short list, if you will. He tells them, don't be deceived. Somebody says, I'm Jesus. No, you're not. Why? Because when Jesus comes, I'm going to fall down flat on my face because of the glory of God. I'll know who Jesus is when he comes. I'm one of his sheep, and I will know his voice. That's what the Bible says in John chapter 10. Don't be deceived. Don't be terrified, he says. Don't be terrified. Don't be afraid. Don't shrink back. You're a king's kid. You've got this. God has got your back. He's got you covered. Doesn't matter what takes place on the earth. Persecutions, trials. Listen. He says, don't be terrified. He says, don't premeditate what you're going to say when it comes to persecution. See, he was telling the disciples, you're going to go before kings and rulers and religious leaders. Don't think about what you're going to say beforehand. I know that's one of the things that I oftentimes will do. I think about it when I see something on the news, something crazy going on, and I think, man, what if I encounter somebody that believes that way? What would I say to them? You start to formulate, well, you know, I would, I would start to say, no, God says don't even do that. Let the Spirit of God lead your words. Because the things that you're going to say, they're going to be God-breathed inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that we should desire to prophesy. You may encounter somebody that's crazy out there. Somebody that does not think the way that you think. Somebody that was not raised the way you were raised. Somebody that is not born again and does not have a regenerate mind. And it will be at that moment that God will give you the gift to be able to speak a word of God into their life. To prophesy and have a ready word in season. A word of wisdom. A word of knowledge. A gift from the Holy Spirit to speak something and to say something. Sometimes all it is is Jesus loves you. And the Bible tells us that a gentle answer turns away wrath and a soft spoken word can break a bone. So you will have the right thing to say at the right time because the Holy Spirit will give it to you in that hour. He says be patient. Be patient through it all church. And finally, let's take a look at this. Luke chapter 21. You're there in Matthew. Turn two books over to Luke chapter 21. I want you to see this in your Bible. Luke chapter 21. We talked about being Happy rejoicing, talked about prayer, talked about not compromising. Finally, we respond with confidence in Jesus. Luke chapter 21, verse 28. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, when you see all these signs, stuff starts getting crazy. When these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads. Because your redemption draws near. Oh my goodness. See, the natural tendency is to back off, to shrink back. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to lower your head and look down. But Jesus said, don't lower your head. Don't cower. Don't hide. No, lift up your heads and rejoice because your redemption draws near. We can have confidence in Jesus. Amen. Four things we learned tonight. Christian's response to a crazy world. We respond, number one, without compromise. Number two, with prayer. We respond, number three, with joy. And number four, we respond with confidence in Jesus. If you got something from the Lord tonight, come on, give him a great big praise.
Hallelujah. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God, had a great time in the presence of God, singing songs, worshiping the Lord. It'd be a tragedy if we heard the word of God like we did tonight. I believe you really got something. It'd be a tragedy if we walked out of this place after having done all of that. You died and your heart wasn't right with God and you ended up going to hell, not going to heaven. Come on, you need some of your attention right now. Don't zone out, don't daydream. This is not the time because your eternal destiny is at stake. Sometimes people are offended with hell, but did you know that the Bible talks about hell? Old and New Testament, Jesus spoke about it, so let's not go there. It's a very real place and you're gonna have to face it. Just by burying your head in the sand and saying, I don't believe in it, doesn't make it any less real. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Listen, if I went out and stood on a slow lane of the freeway, I would meet one face to face sooner or later. So come on, let's talk about your life. God doesn't want you to go to hell. The Bible is very clear about that. It was never intended for you or for me. It was intended for the devil and his angels that rebelled. And yet we can choose with our time here on the earth where we go, whether heaven or hell. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, don't all roads lead to heaven? I mean, you have your truth, I have my truth, as long as we are true to ourselves. God sees that and appreciates that, and God's loving and kind, and therefore he lets everybody into heaven, just as long as they stay true to their own thing, right? No, wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say that all roads lead to heaven. It's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Not going to make it. You've got to get there one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Can't get there your way. Can't get there my way. Can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, went to the cross, beaten, bloody, public spectacle for all to see? If he went through all that, don't you think that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. Now, sometimes people say, well, that's good news. Because, you know, I've been a really good person all my life, done a lot of good deeds, gave money to charities, been nice to my neighbors, got involved in social justice and that sort of a thing. I wear shoes that help people cross the world and drink water that digs wells. Therefore, I know that God sees my good works. And even though I've been bad and was bad, you know, he's going to let me into heaven because my good. And my good outweighs my bad, you know. So I've been working on my resume and therefore God's going to let me into heaven. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get to heaven? Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it say just do good works, do good things. If your good outweighs your bad, you help people out, nice to your neighbor, give money to charity. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere does it say you can be good enough to get into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because, you know, you've been good and nice and that sort of thing, God notices that and sees those good works and says, all right, well, you can get into heaven. You've been good enough. How good is good enough? Well, the standard of the Bible is perfection. The only one who is perfect, well, his name is Jesus. So you're not going to get there based on your goodness. Your goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags, the Bible says. Therefore, it's going to get thrown out. And so tonight, let's talk about your eternal life. Let's talk about your eternal destiny. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you would say, well, pastor, hold on a second. Not only have I been a good person, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up always considered myself to be a Christian. Maybe they hung a cross for St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized your Christian as a child, took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And therefore, you've always thought of yourself as a Christian. Born in America, America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying hell, right? Wrong. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you were raised in church that gets you into heaven? Nor in the Bible say that you go to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, that that gets you into heaven. Nor in the Bible does it record that America is a Christian nation, and if you're born in America, you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that God looks at your life to see whether you're a Christian or you're not some other religion. And if you're not some other religion, that he lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. It doesn't work like that. Come on, let's talk. Some of you might be thinking, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here am I sitting in church right now, Pastor. Doesn't that mean I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I'm in church. Well, you know that nowhere in the Bible says you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? Check it out. It's not there. It's like saying I could wear an angel's uniform, go to the angel stadium in Anaheim, sit in the dugout, bring my bat and my ball, call myself an angel, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know, they're going to find me sitting there, drag me out, and lock me up. Why? Because I'm not a part of the angel's organization. 
And therefore, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. You say, but I, I got involved in my last church. I sang in the choir for a number of years. I helped out. I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I taught in the Bible classes, even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Could you just show that to me in the Bible? Where your church involvement gets you into heaven? It doesn't work. You know when the Bible says sing in a choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions, people think of you as a leader? Because you teach in a Bible class or because you have a membership card that God is looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. It simply doesn't work like that. Come on, come on. Let's talk about your life. Where are you going to go? Are you going to go to heaven? Are you going to go to hell? Now, sometimes people say, but wait, I'm going to go to heaven because I know who God is. I know God. I, I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas, sing the songs every year of my life. And, and, and I could quote scriptures to you. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But did you know that there's a lot of people in America that claim to know God? Not everybody in America is going to heaven. Not everybody who can quote scriptures or sing some songs, celebrate a holiday, gets to go to heaven because they know about who Jesus is. Come on, everybody knows who Jesus is. Even the non-Christians know who Jesus is. That doesn't mean that they're going to get to go to heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who he is and being able to quote scripture that gets you right with God. But rather this is about your heart. How do I know that? Because the Bible records the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So this is not about your head, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus said these words to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know those words are oftentimes offensive, but remember, who cares? This is not about what the world says or movies or television or books or Hollywood or any of that kind of stuff. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Does it mean good works? Does it mean church attendance? Does it mean being involved? Does it mean knowing who God is? No, it doesn't mean any of that. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, being born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. Just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible. Jesus is speaking to the church just like he's speaking of this church here tonight. And what he says is, he says, when I come, don't you know he's coming soon? We've seen the signs. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are some graphic, gross words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out. Little up, little down, little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but He's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because Jesus said, If you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this one, two, three. Three, and I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up, and then I'll count it, and you can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Hold on, time out. If I raise my hand, I'd be embarrassed. Mm -hmm, you might be. Let's get past that. Let's get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. So tonight, who should raise their hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart and life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can make a right relationship with Jesus Christ. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, or if you hear the sound of my voice in the breezeways, 
wherever you're at all over the world on the live stream, you can raise your hand. God is watching right where you're at. Come on, let's get ready to get our hands up. Here we go all together on the count of three. If you need to give God all of your heart, all of your life, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three. Thank you. Four, five. Gotcha. Who else tonight? There's five wise people. Six. Thank you. Seven, eight, nine. Gotcha. Ten up in the family room. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? About ten wise people already. Got you guys. Thank you. You can put your hands in. I had two hands up. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Eleven. Got you right there. Who else tonight? You're saying, yeah, I need to do this. I need to give God all my heart. I need to give God all my life. It's been crazy, but I'm ready to go with God. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else? If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should do this. Who else tonight? Who else? That's you. Where are they at? Just wave it at me if your hand is up. Anybody else? They're still pointing down this way. I don't see them. Is that, gotcha right there. Thank you, 12. Gotcha. Who else? Anybody else real quick? Thank you, 13. Anybody else real quick? Number 14, yes, gotcha right there. Don't you know there's 15? You're just sitting there saying, gosh, I know I need to do this. Heart's pounding out of your chest. Come on, go for it. Go for it. Come on, number 15, where are you? We're waiting for you. God loves you so much. Come on, just pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Where are you at, number 15? Thank you, number 15. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Hallelujah. God is so good. God is so good. Hey, all 15 of you, anybody else, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Or if you're out there in the foyer, back in the family rooms, hey, get your stuff. Whatever you brought with you to church, get a friend if you need a friend. If you're in the family rooms with your children, they're welcome to come with you. They will remember this. No one leave during this time. We're trying to get people down here. Very hard to do when you're going that way. They'll follow you that way. Let them come this way. If you're sitting next to somebody, say, come on, friend. I'll go with you tonight, okay? So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on down, come on down, come on down. Hallelujah, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You're all I need to come and make me new. Come on, you can come too. They're coming. They're coming. This is your time. This is your moment. You're all I need. There's room for you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. To you, my heart to Everybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. Come on down. Come on down. So come and make me new. All right. Hey, everybody up front. Thank God you guys have come. Put a big smile on your face. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing, all right? You came to give God all your heart. You came to give God all of your life, all right? Let me introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Dr. Becker. Okay, Dr. Becker, or if you want to call him Dr. B, he's cool with that. He's a good guy. All right, nothing weird's going to go on. Sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they crazy, right? Are they weird? Listen, you already got past this one, all right? He's about as crazy and weird as you're going to get tonight. He's cool. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to do three things, okay? First thing he's going to do is he's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, headed for heaven, all right? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. I told you the F word around here was free, all right? So here we are already. You guys love getting free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. So that's a good relationship already, okay? A couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have in the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym, helps you get strong, helps you get buff, that sort of a thing, make sure you're eating right. Okay, spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who'll come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible, real simple, one a week, okay? Meet you a couple minutes before church and get you something to drink, maybe a little something to eat, that sort of a thing, and just sit with you, answer any questions, pray with you, and teach you those five things out of the Bible that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Now listen, I'm going to make a promise to you guys. Here's the promise. Give us one year of your life. Just one year here at the Rock Church, sitting under the teaching at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. Okay? Make a commitment and be consistent with it. Okay? Get in church as much as you can. And after that year, sitting under the Word of God, you will be so blessed that you will say, I didn't know it could be this good. Am I telling the truth, everybody? It all starts with five weeks with an SPT. If you guys will make a left turn and follow Dr. Becker right this way. Love you, Dr. B. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. 
hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.